In today's talk, I want to discuss several methods of non-radiative recombination, uh, including Auger and surface recombination. That will bring us to the end of this discussion on different types of recombination, both radiative and non-radiative. Non-radiative recombination, as you know, is a source of losses in devices like LEDs and lasers. So we would like to understand uh, the processes of non-radiative recombination and thereafter tailor both the materials as well as the devices so we can reduce uh, non-radiative recombination and thereby increase the radiative recombination efficiency. So today at the beginning I'll talk about Auger processes, uh, which are three-body processes, and in brief I'll talk about surface recombination. And finally I'll give some comparison between the rates of radiative and non-radiative recombination, uh, comparing the lifetimes of radiative and non-radiative recombination processes in indirect gap semiconductors like germanium and in direct gap semiconductors like gallium arsenide. So let us talk about uh, Auger recombination. The name comes from the name of a scientist, Pierre Auger, who discovered this process in cosmic rays. So it was a high energy process, uh, but it occurs nevertheless in solids and uh, as you know, Auger spectroscopy is a method of materials characterization based on, on the same process. Um, when is Auger recombination is important? It is important at high temperatures, relatively high temperatures, let's say, and at high doping densities. say 10 to the power 18 and above. And it is also found to be more important at low band gap materials for e.g. less than about 1.5 electron volts. Because obviously uh, for low band gaps the carrier concentration uh, is going to be large. And it is important in materials like indium gallium arsenide which has a band gap of about 0.75 EV and is a very important detector material for fiber optics. Now, if we sketch the Auger process in a semiconductor, we can identify several Auger mechanisms. Let us uh, start with the most simple. Uh, for example, if in a semiconductor, in a conduction band, we have an electron uh, recombining with a hole, the excess energy can be given to another electron in the conduction band. Um, and thereafter, this electron relaxes you know, with the emission of uh, phonons. So instead of radiative recombination where light is emitted, in this case, the energy is given as kinetic energy to another electron. Um, so this is called an intrinsic Auger process. It's also called... Uh, 
CCHC process. As you can understand, uh, this nomenclature comes from the fact that C and C stands for conduction electrons. There are two conduction electrons, one hole, and the resultant energy is given to another conduction band electron. So this is called a CCHC process. Uh, similarly, we can have the counterpart of this. We can have an electron recombining with a hole in the valence band and the excess energy being given to another hole. If this was process A, we can say this is process B. And uh, what would this process be called? This was called obviously C, H, H, and uh, which um, the whole getting the excess energy, this is called uh, C, C, H, S. Um, S, the whole may be going into the split off band, higher energy, so it's called C, H, H, S process. Right. Now, in this case, as you see, uh, the donors and acceptors are not involved, right? So these are both intrinsic Auger processes. And we'll dis distinguish between these intrinsic Auger processes and extrinsic Auger processes. The probabilities will be different, and uh, the rates will obviously be different. Now, okay, in this, if we want to depict... Extrinsic Auger processes, we could start off with, suppose there is a donor level in which there are electrons. Recombination may occur between a donor electron and a hole, and the excess energy may be given to a, uh, another electron, which is excited into the conduction band. Okay, So this, we can see, um, it's an extrinsic process. Because donors, uh, extrinsic electrons are involved at the donors. And we obviously, where donors are involved, uh, this, is a material, this is a process that occurs in n-type semiconductors. Okay? Now, we can have various uh, versions of this. We can have electron at the donor recombining with a hole and the excess energy being given to a conduction band electron. Okay? So this is, again, for an n-type semiconductor. Um, we can have a process in which an electron recombines with a hole, electron at a donor recombines with a hole, and energy is given to another hole. Okay. Um, so... This is also um, a process in which donors are, are there, but <clears throat> the whole concentration being large, this could occur in a p-type semiconductor. Um, I don't want to sketch all the different processes, but uh, maybe I'll sketch a few more. Uh, there are processes in which we can have Uh, electron in a conduction band going to an acceptor and an electron being ejected. Okay. Uh, this could occur mainly in an n-type semiconductor. We could have a electron losing its energy to an acceptor and then a hole being excited. Uh, this is in a p-type semiconductor, and we could have um, processes such as these. We could have donor-acceptor processes in which 
electron goes from the donor to an acceptor and uh, an electron from a donor is excited. This is typically could be for an n-type semiconductor. Okay. So, uh, there could be a process in which there is uh, resonant absorption in which, which does not result in any f um, free carriers. An electron could combine with a with a hole, and a hole could in turn be excited. Okay, so this is a resonant process in which uh, there are, there's no resultant uh, free carrier. Okay. This is called a, a resonant process, which may be important in it's called resonant absorption. And these are all uh, extrinsic. Auger processes. Now, um, let us try and examine uh, the physics of this um, Auger recombination, which involves obviously the detailed band structure. Suppose we take a direct band gas semiconductor and we have to involve all the different types of valence bands, heavy hole, light hole bands, and the split off band. Suppose we this is a conduction band, this is the valence band, and obviously this is a three body process. Suppose at Initially, we have an electron here with a momentum K1, which is interacting with a hole with momentum K1 dashed. And this results, recombination of electron and hole results in another electron with momentum K2 getting the excess kinetic energy. This is obviously an EK diagram. And this is the initial condition. After the process occurs, then we are finally left with one electron This was the initial process, and finally we are left with one electron which has now got a momentum K2 dashed, uh, and excess energy due to this electron combining with, with the hole. So this is the final picture. Now, Immediately you will see that this is the inverse of a process which is called impact ionization. Uh, why is that? Because in impact ionization what happens is that a high energy electron comes along. Okay? It, this is the initial picture, a high energy electron accelerated by an electric field comes along, it creates an electron hole pair, it loses energy, creates an electron hole pair. and uh, it uh, stays with a lower energy. So, for impact ionization, the initial picture is this, and the final picture is this. And uh, impact ionization is a phenomenon which is very important in uh, avalanche photodetectors, so we'll discuss this process in, uh, in detail there. And we want to find out what are the thresholds, what are the rates of this impact ionization. So, one could say that if OGI process is depicted there, the impact ionization process is just the inverse. This is the initial state and this is the final state. 
Right. Uh, I won't go into the, this is, what I've discussed here is a CCHC process, okay. And I'll take that as an example. We have in this process two electrons plus one hole involved, okay. And I'll give the methodology of treatment of uh, calculation of the recombination rate and the probability without going into all the detailed uh, mathematics. Uh, we want to calculate what are the what is the probability of this process which involves an electron with momentum k1 uh, uh, electron with momentum k2 and a hole with momentum k1 dashed and this must obviously be connected with and proportional to the occupancy of electrons with momentum k1, occupancy of electrons with momentum k2, and the 1 minus the occupancy of f k1 dashed, which is the um, probability of of a hole being found with momentum k1 dashed. So these are the occupation factors. Um, we know what these occupation factors are. Fk1 is equal to n by nc exponential minus eck1 by kb fk2 is n by nc exponential minus eck2 by kb is the Boltzmann factor and 1 minus fk1 dashed is p by nv exponential minus evk1 dashed by KBT. So if we multiply these together, we get the overall probability factor P is NP into N over NC to NV to NC exponential minus ECK2 plus EVK1 dashed plus ECK1 over KBT. And we know that N into P is NI squared, and we know NI squared is NC, uh, NV root minus EG by KT, so we can... This factor, NP over NC by NV, is just related to the band gap. So we have minus EG coming in, plus these factors, plus ECK2, plus EVK1 dashed, plus ECK1 over KBT. Okay. Now, this is uh, fairly straightforward. Now, what we have to uh, observe at this process uh, involves conservation of both momentum and energy. So let's take momentum conservation first. This process will be maximized if we have K1 plus K1 dashed plus K2. The sum of the initial momenta should be equal to minus K2 dashed. Um, 
that is one condition. Uh, we can now try and uh, get a detailed uh, condition for this. Um, we can write, for example, K1 is equal to, we can define K1 as some constant into K1 dashed, K2 as some factor B into K1 dashed, and uh, the conservation of momentum requires that K2 dashed will be equal to A plus B plus 1 into K2 dashed. This is one condition. Um, for conservation of energy, we get, uh, we can write mu is equal to mc star by mv star, the ratio of the conduction and the whole effective masses. And uh, in that case, the conservation of energy condition comes to k2 dashed squared is equal to a squared plus b squared plus mu k1 dashed squared plus kg squared, where kg squared is given by just h squared kg squared twice mc star. This is the band gap energy. So kg corresponds to the momentum related to the band gap eg. So this is uh, another condition. And if we plug this into the probability expression, then we find that P K1 K2 K1 dashed is now N by NC exponential minus 1 plus 2 mu over 1 plus mu. E G by K B T. Um, the probability is maximized if E C K one is equal to E C K two is equal to mu E V K one dashed, which is equal to mu squared. 1 plus 3 mu plus 2 mu squared into Eg. Looking uh, at this expression, uh, we find the probability is maximized if this is uh, obeyed. Or if we rewrite this, we have Ec k2 dashed is related to Eg by a simple expression Ec K2 dashed as you remember is uh, is the final momentum of the electron and this is the band gap of a semiconductor and mu is just the relation of the ratio of the effective masses. So we have a uh, a relation that we use again for impact ionization condition that suppose if take mu is equal to 1 uh, we for known semiconductors the value of mu is known but suppose we take a simple condition that uh, mu is equal to 1 the effective masses are equal then what what is the condition ECK2 dash the energy 
of the electron uh, after the Auger process is just 3 by 2 eg. Right? Um, yeah, if we take, for example, the other condition that mu is tending to zero, that means the uh, it's a material with very low conduction band effective mass and uh, the whole effective mass is rather large, then what do we have? We have ECK2 dashed is just equal to EG because then the energy uh, taken by the whole because it's very massive uh, is very small. Here we have equal sharing of energy between the electron and the whole. Okay? Uh, the mass is the same. So these are the two uh, extreme conditions uh, for impact ionization. ECK2 dashed is one and a half times EG uh, varying from one half times to the value of EG. So this is the threshold condition for uh, impact ionization and for example um, one can depict this process um, that I've mentioned. This process is saying that okay, uh, the, mom the momenta before collisions, say this is K1 dashed, this is K1, and this is K2, must be equal uh, to the momentum, equal and opposite to the momentum after collision, K2 dashed. So this is a diagrammatic uh, representation of this momentum uh, conservation condition. So the rates can be calculated and uh, finally the Auger transition rate it's if we multiply the uh, occupation probabilities by the transition uh, probability, then we get a rather long expression integral over all the allowed k values, then we have the matrix element m squared into the probability that we've calculated into a delta function which gives you the energy conservation relation So this is the final expression for the Auger transition rate where m squared is the screened Coulomb matrix element for ionized impurity scattering. This is just to show you what is the method of uh, uh, calculation. And uh, for parabolic bands, the relation is, uh, final relation is much simplified. Uh, you can say W is the Auger recombination rate, which is Auger coefficient into n cubed and for parabolic bands E proportional to K squared W recombination is 
e fourth m c to the power m c star k b t to the power three by two m c star over m plus mu. It's a fairly long expression, but we are interested only in the semiconductor materials. So there is mu is obviously material dependent, e.g. to the power 3 by 2, and exponential minus 1 plus mu, e.g. over kBT. So we can write that as k, some constant, okay, which absorbs all the uh, constant terms kb to the power 3 by 2 by eg to the power 3 by 2 exponential minus 1 plus Okay, so this is a very important expression which illustrates that this Auger rate goes as t to the power 3 by 2. That's why I'm saying that it increases at higher uh, temperature. Also, there is this exponential term has t in the denominator. So at uh, large values of t, this um, again this is an exponential dependence on e.g. by kt. Okay, so... Um, Small values of eg, small values of eg, here and here, of course, the exponential term dominates. Small values of eg and large values of t increase this Auger recombination term. Okay. And uh, graphically, one can show that. The function of n, this goes as 10 to the power 23 to 10 to the power 29, and we have, um, this is as a function of n going from 10 to the power 16 to n to the power uh, 20, 20. Uh, this is in centimeter cube per second, so it increases very rapidly as n increases as expected. And if we look at the Auger coefficients, uh, say f centimeters, six typical materials, indium gallium arsenide, this value is 10 to the power minus 28 for a band gap of 0.75 EV. Uh, for Galliuminium arsenide phosphide band gap of 0.8. This is of the order of what? 6 10 to the power 28. So or the order of magnitude is, is important. Um, um, and as I've shown, um, it is highly sensitive to the value of Eg if Eg is small and T is large, uh, above at room temperature and above Auger recombination uh, dominates. Uh, another way of showing this is if we compare uh, Auger as well as the lifetime, which is inversely proportional to the recombination rate, as a function of temperature. This is high temperature, this is relatively low temperature. Uh, we find that the Auger recombination rate goes something like this. Whereas the Radiative recombination rate goes something like an 
experimentally, we find uh, that, for example, if this is 1 by nu r and this is 1 by nu a, experimentally, the curve goes something like, like that, which is 1 by tau a plus tau r. So we find that at high temperature, it is the Auger process that is dominating, okay? and at low temperature, it is the radiative recombination that is dominating. The Auger rate is uh, too small, and the radiative process is dominates. So, so much for Auger recombination. A word about another recombination mechanism which is important in devices, and that is surface recombination. Uh, if you have a, a semiconductor with band bending at the surface, say this is an n-type semiconductor, Fermi level being pinned here at a value of phi 0 above the valence band, the barrier height being phi b. We know that uh, this is happening because there is maybe a high density of surface states here. And as a result, the carrier concentration, the whole concentration this is P0, the whole concentration um, at the surface this is X says this is at the surface it is something P0 Okay, and then we then know that the surface recombination rate Rs is sigma H Vth. It is exactly similar to the bulk recombination, except that there is surface dependence due to NST X1 P0 minus P0. This is the gradient in the whole concentration between the bulk and the surface. And so we have that the whole concentration given by diffusion concentration, diffusion coefficient into the gradient at x equal to 0 at the surface is nothing but SR into P0 minus P0. And SR is the surface recombination velocity, which is just sigma h vth into nst. So when we have carriers near the surface, there's a surface recombination velocity that depends upon the minority carrier uh, capture cross-section. We have taken an n-type material, so this is the capture cross-section for minority carriers or holes thermal velocity and NST is the capture cons uh, is the concentration. And we know that SR could vary between something like 10 to the power 7 centimeters per second to something very small, something like 0.1 centimeters per second. And we can reduce uh, surface recombination uh, by various techniques, by Oxidation in the case of silicon by having a gas and gas interface, uh, lattice matched heterojunction, uh, or by uh, similar techniques. So now we've seen uh, various types of uh, radiative and non radiative recombination mechanisms. Let's uh, now see what is the in the case of first germanium and in secondly in the case of gallium arsenide, uh, how the 
Let's see. Um, if we plot the lifetime uh, as a function of carrier concentration, this should indicate to us uh, which of the processes dominate. We know that the effective lifetime depends upon 1 by tau effective is equal to 1 by tau 1 plus 1 by tau 2, 1 by tau 3, etc. And the process with the shorter lifetime dominates. So we want to see how these different process, what the lifetime due to the different processes is in a semiconductor like germanium at, say, room temperature. Uh, here, this side we have n-type semiconductor going up to 10 to the power 18 carrier concentration. We have p-type semiconductor going up to 10 to the power 18. And if we just plot some of the main processes involved, we find that for germanium, this, okay, let's calibrate this axis. This is, say, 10 to the power minus 8 to something like 10 to the power plus 4 seconds. Germanium being an indirect cap semiconductor, the uh, lifetime for radiative recombination is rather long, rather slow. So we have um, A is radiative lifetime. Um, B is intrinsic Oje. C is multiphonon. And D is extrinsic. Okay, let me quickly draw this uh, same process for gallimastinite and then we can make a comparison. Uh, we have for gallimastinite that is D That's B. And being a direct cap semiconductor, we expect radiative to dominate, and this is A. And we have the same axis here, 10 to the power 18 to 10 to the power P and N. So in a nutshell, if you want to look at this, uh, for germanium, what do we find? That for low doping concentration, uh, it is this multiphonon process that dominates, right? This is the, uh, the process with the lowest value of T obviously dominates. So right through here, uh, C, process C, multiphonon dominates, uh, and then you see that 
here B is coming down, so intrinsic Auger is, is crossing, and radiative is way, way off here. Okay? So it is not a radiative recombination is, is uh, quenched by the other processes. But in the case of gallium arsenide, what do we find? That right over this range, okay, it is the radiative process that is dominating. Next is multiphonon. After that, we have intrinsic Auger and uh, sorry, the, after that we have extrinsic Auger and intrinsic Auger. So this is a, a graphical representation of the competition between the different recombination processes, which shows that in the case of germanium, it is a multiphonon emission uh, through defects um, um, 